Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are going to investigate a very crucial and practically relevant question, that is, how to integrate trading costs or transaction fees into mean variance portfolio optimization. Sometimes you have got some initial allocation into your portfolio, and you are exposed to some level of trading fees, and you want to implement that into optimizing your portfolio in terms of risk and return. Obviously, it doesn't stop there, and the lessons learned from this tutorial can be implemented into more sophisticated portfolio management techniques to account for trading costs and their impact there. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, as we have got here six well-established US stocks, as usual, over a 10-year period, and we have got a US S&P 500 benchmark as well to calculate betas and expected returns to make our analysis more reliable on an expected return basis. So first of all, we'll calculate daily returns by dividing price today by price yesterday and subtracting one for all six stocks and the benchmark extended throughout the whole sample. Then we can take into account our risk free rate that would help us in our CAPM calculations later on. Our risk free rate is 1.57% that is the relevant US-based risk free rate as of mid-November. Now we can calculate uh, holding period returns. We can do it either using prices or using the daily returns we have just calculated. So let's just use prices for simplicity, dividing the very last price observed for a particular stock, dividing it by the price at the start, and raising it to the power of 1 over 10 to get annualized returns as we are dealing with a 10-year period, and subtracting 1. Then we can drag it across to get annualized returns for six stocks plus the benchmark. And the beta can be calculated by using the slope function, effectively regressing the stock returns, a column of stock returns over here, onto the column of daily market returns with locked columns, as the market doesn't change for all six stocks. We can get our beta calculations as usual. We can double check that the beta for the market is indeed one, so we haven't made a mistake anywhere, and we can calculate expected returns as per kappa. First of all, taking the risk free rate, locking it both row and column wise, as the risk free rate does not change for um, any intents and purposes of our calculations, and then we add individual stock betas multiplied by excess market returns, which are just the market return, the return of S&P 500 over a 10-year period, for the market return, obviously, as it evens out all of the idiosyncratic risks and all of the disturbances for long enough time periods, you can treat historical returns as expected returns. With some caution, though, if your sample size is smaller. But 10 years is arguably large enough for these purposes. And to make it excess, so equity risk premium, we subtract the risk free rate. And we get an expected return of JP Morgan at roughly 20% per annum, given the level of market risk it exposes an investor to. And then we can direct across for all six stocks, calculating their CAPM expected returns. Then we need to figure out what were our initial weights. So let's assume that here our rebalancing was motivated by um, JP Morgan inclusion into our portfolio. For example, we figured out that the stock is undervalued, or that, that its expected return as per CAPM is quite high and is consistent with our, for example, below average risk aversion. So initially, we had nothing allocated to JP Morgan, and we had an equally weighted portfolio that distributed 20% of our capital into all of the remaining five stocks, 20% each. And we want to optimize new weights, um, some weights of a new portfolio, taking into account a trading fee that, for example, can be 1% of the trading volume. And here we can start with new weights that exactly mimic the old weights and see if we can improve upon the previous allocation when trading costs are taken into account. Because obviously, the higher the trading costs, 
the more the optimization algorithm would prefer the initial allocation, as keeping the initial allocation is free and modifying it is costly. And the more you modify it, the more you trade, the higher is the fee that you have to pay. And we'll account for it by using the net return formula. More about it a little bit later. What we need to do is we obviously need to check that the sum of our new weights remains 100% or 1. We do not pull money out of thin air and we do not want to leave any of our funds as cash in this particular example. And we can calculate our gross return and our risk for the portfolio. But for that, and here is where it becomes crucial to understand why trading fees are so penalizing for short-term trading and so less relevant for longer-term trading, is we need to take into account our investment horizon in days. So let's assume we're investing for a year, for a year ahead. That means that our horizon is 252 trading days, as there are in the US, on average, 252 trading days in a year. That would mean that our gross return would be some product of our new weights multiplied by the expected returns, and then we need to take into account the investment horizon. This is annual expected return calculation based on kappa. So now to adjust it to whatever frequency we have got, we can raise it to the power of the investment horizon divided by 252 minus 1. And that would give us an annualized gross return or investment horizon related gross return of 14.18%. Now we have to figure out how much do we trade, how much um, transactions do we make to get from our initial weights to the new weights. And that, uh, without any attachment to our portfolio value, here calculations do not depend at all on portfolio value, as our trading fee is relative, 1% of volume and not absolute, our trading volume would be the sum of absolute changes in weights. And this volume can be treated as volume in proportion to portfolio value. So obviously, in our current case, when we do not rebalance at all, we uh, have a trading volume of zero. However, if we do want to rebalance somehow, for example, allocate a sixth of our capital into each new stock, including JP Morgan, our trading volume would be 33.33% of portfolio value, as we buy 16.67% of JP Morgan, and we had to sell that much in terms of every single other stock. That's why we have got our trading volume going both ways, both in terms of sales and buys. And our fees paid are charged on every transaction we make, so we multiply our trading volume by the fee that we're exposed to, and we have got our fees paid in terms of portfolio value. And now we can finally calculate our net return subject to the fees we have paid. That would be 1 plus our gross return times 1 minus the fees minus 1. This is an approach that penalizes you upfront for the fees that you're paying. As fees, you pay to the broker straight away. And that basically means that fees that you pay are implicitly capitalized when your portfolio um, is providing you with a return later on. It means that fees are even worse than just subtracting this amount from your gross return as they capitalize. This particular algorithm, this particular procedure accounts for that and makes our estimation more realistic and more conservative. For the risk, we can simply calculate a simulated portfolio return using the weights that we've got. So here in the portfolio column, some product of the respective stock returns as well as the new weights. For new weights, we need to lock the row, enforce it throughout, and calculate our standard deviation, bearing in mind the investing horizon. So we do stdv.s over the course of the whole portfolio returns column, and we multiply it by the square root of the number of trading days in our investing horizon. So we see here that our 252 day risk, annualized risk, in that regard, is 16.34%. Now we need to take into account uh, our risk aversion, uh, risk aversion coefficient theta. Let's assume we are a medium uh, risk tolerance, medium risk aversion, with theta equal to 3. 
for investors with high risk conversion, uh, low risk tolerance, that would be something like four or even five. And for investors with high risk tolerance, low risk conversion, this would be lower, most likely two. That is a conventional parameterization. But let's stick with three, let's stick with the average. And as for the utility, we can simply subtract from our net return that takes into account the fees we've paid, theta over two times our risk squared, which is variance. And that is especially important that we use the utility function uh, when we are dealing with investing for different uh, periods, simply because this utility function is time consistent. As both your return and your risk scale linearly, this utility function is consistent across different investment horizons. You would, disregarding the fees, that is, choose the same investment opportunity, the same prospects, regardless of your horizon. That is a very common and very famous property of this utility function. However, we'll see how trading fees come into the picture and change this particular property. So the only thing left remaining now is to specify our solver task, our optimization task, and compare different cases in terms of trading fees and investment horizons. So let's go solver and specify that we want to maximize our utility by changing our new weights, subject to the constraint that our sum of weights should be equal to 1. And that's all there is. Nothing else needs to be taken into account, as everything else is accounted for by our net return formula and our return and risk calculations. So we can simply click solve and wait until the algorithm converges to the solution. It have just done so, and we see that subject to a trading fee of 1%, we are allocating 22.38% into JP Morgan, However, we leave exactly the same allocation in Caterpillar, as it was um, not beneficial, given that level of trading costs, to forgo any investment in Caterpillar, as it was quite consistent with our risk appetite, and it did deliver quite uh, substantial returns still. So this is how this would be different to a conventional optimization, when your trading fee is zero. The case where your trading fees are zero provides you with a much higher exposure to JP Morgan and Microsoft, stocks with the highest expected returns there, and it does reduce your investment in Caterpillar. Basically, the higher your trading fees are, the less you trade, as you are explicitly discouraged from trading a lot by the fees your broker imposes onto you. But let's now consider an even higher fee of 2%, for example. That's a pretty high fee level, so let's see what is our model's result under this stress testing kind of scenario. If we click solve, we would see that our allocation changes less than in the initial 1% uh, um, scenario, with only 12%, uh, almost 13% actually, invested in JP Morgan, and four of initial uh, allocations left almost unchanged. Microsoft exposure is unchanged um, exactly, whereas these three were changed um, marginally. And finally, when our trading fee is um, astronomical, like 10%, we can see that even though uh, JP Morgan might provide us with better returns, the best strategy would be simply to stick with the original weights as the trading fee is too high and too prohibitive. However, what would happen if our investing horizon is not a year, but rather 10 years. If it's 2,520 days, would it change anything at all in terms of how this extortion of a fee affects our incentives? Let's check this out. If we click solve here, we would see that despite the fact that this fee is too high, if we're investing for a 10-year period and we're committed to not rebalancing our portfolio in this uh, particular time horizon, we are incentivized to invest 56% of our capital into JP Morgan, even though we'd have to pay almost 6% of our portfolio value to our broker to facilitate this trade. The algorithm believes that this is optimal, given the fact that we are committed to our portfolio for 10 years. And that actually teaches you quite a bit about uh, the differences between 
active and passive investing, about different investing horizons, and about the impact of fees that is different for these approaches. If you stick with your portfolio for a long time, then fees are not a major concern. However, if you are rebalancing very often, then even moderate fees can wipe out all of your outperformance, all of your abnormal returns, and uh, leave you with nothing, basically. And that is how to integrate trading fees and investment horizons into your portfolio optimization framework. Obviously, this is not only exclusive to the mean variance approach. You could use um, utility function with skewness and catasis, something that I've showed in one of the previous tutorials. The implementation would not change at all. Or you can even uh, do something uh, even more specific. For example, uh, optimize diversification ratio or risk parity based on different return targets and different risk criteria. And that's all there is for such an implementation in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.